to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Say welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. We're going to get back into our Father's Word. And as I have stated, this particular chapter, chapter 25, is personal. It has to do with corporal punishment and uh, how it should be kind of make the punishment fit the crime. And that's why we say judgment. And a judge is supposed to be able to uh, rightly and justly issue punishment, but remember he was always to observe. Therefore, if he was a judge that gave too many stripes and couldn't stand the sight of blood, maybe he would, if it was over done, he could light, he learned to lighten the sentence. So God intended that a judge witness his sentencing. And I suppose that God knows his children pretty well, does he not? So we came to the point concerning kinsman redeemer in the 10th verse. We're going to pick it up in the 11th verse, chapter 25. This is, this is a little bit, um, some would say graphic. In the spiritual sense, it isn't, so we'll teach it in that sense. Chapter 25, verse 11, and it reads, When men strive together, one with another, that means they're fighting, and the wife of the one draweth near for to deliver her husband out of the hand of him that smiteth him, and putteth forth her hand and taketh him by the secrets. Now, many think, oh, how could that be? Well, we teach our women to this day that if she is attacked by a man, that's what she goes for. You know, knees, foot, kick, hammer, whatever. Okay, so there's not, don't, don't think that's that old fashioned. That's train, modern training of today. And also, I would say at the same time, uh, note this bond between husband and wife. You want to be very careful of that because um, a, a wife will kill for her husband, you know. And so uh, something you want to bear in mind. We'll, we'll give the spiritual connotation here in a moment. Verse 12. Then thou shalt cut off her hand, thine eye shall not pity her. Now, of course, uh, perhaps um, this was uh, for that day. Naturally, we have to obey civil law today, and this is not something we can practice. Thus, I think it is the spiritual connotation that your father really wants you to grasp. We are the wife of of Christ. If you prefer the word bride, be that as it may, the bride of Christ. And when the false Christ comes, you will allow him to, uh, when he begins to seduce spiritually some that claim to be the bride of Christ because they think they're going to fly away, then you will only react as our Father through the Holy Spirit instructs you. It's very well recorded in Mark 13 what you will and won't do. You will not premeditate what you will do. So don't you visualize yourself grabbing old Satan anywhere or doing anything else while he's messing with the bride of Christ. All right. You let the Holy Spirit uh, take its course and it will warn you. It is natural that that is the... Now, this is not to say that you're not to rebuke Satan in your own private life. I mean, take names and kick dragon. But I'm talking about the ultimate when we're ready to play the role of the bride of Christ, the wife of Christ. I can give you, in my opinion, well, it isn't my opinion, it's fact. There is a wife and there is a bride. The wife was was married in the first earth age. She's called the election. That's why God would say in Romans chapter 8, you are already justified, meaning you partook, so I can intercede in your life. So you look at it at a deeper, deeper level. So the wife must especially 
give heed to this particular law and convert that to the spiritual, which is the only thing that applies other than self-defense, and go with it. Verse 13, thou shalt not have in thy bag diverse, that means different weights, a great and a small. That means for your brother, you may have a equal measure or a correct measure. But for someone else, you may have a measure that shorts him, uh, weighs him a little bit short, or puts a butcher like that puts his thumb on the scales and sells you steak by the weight of however much he wishes to push. That's stealing, it's cheating, and God doesn't like it. It compounds the fracture, however, when you do it to some and not to others. That's, uh, God demands that in your profession that you treat everyone the same and be not a respecter of persons. Now, I'm going to tell you something. If you operate a business and you expect it to do well, if you do good for some people and not others, I'm sorry. You're not going to have God's blessings. God does not appreciate people that show favoritism. Now, uh, this ex I'm talking about profession now. I'm not talking about a person's personal love and this sort of thing. Naturally, if you love someone, you're not going to treat everybody like the one you love. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about in business. If there are certain groups of people that you might decide you're going to hold them up for a little higher price, then just, just subtract all of God's blessings. He's going to get you. God respects and rewards honesty. And why am I saying this? Because many people, many people, because of prejudice, and other reasons will carry the unbalanced weights and not even be aware of it. It's all here in the art of bartering. So remember, God expects us to be fair to all. You know, I'll give you an example of how I apply this. At one time, when this was a small ministry, which it's not anymore, we have hundreds of thousands of students, uh, there was at one time I could counsel by phone. Any, any one of our church that had a problem or something. And then we grew to such a proportion that there was no way I could teach God's Word, that is to say have time to research, to study, and to keep, um, keep my own personal businesses up. Because as you know, I don't take a salary from the church, so I have to work like everybody else to make, make the money to sustain myself. So. Uh, it came to a point where I had to cease taking telephone calls from anyone because why? I'm not going to do for one that I want for all. And if it isn't possible to do for all, why? Why would I do that? Because God will not bless you if you show favoritism. It's a good thing for you to remember that. And it's a very difficult task uh, to perform in your own life, but you'd better make a good stab at it. If you are in a position or in a way of business or even the way you befriend people, be fair, all right? Human nature is human nature. I understand that, but you can carry diverse weights without realizing it sometimes if you're not careful. I only stress that for your own benefit. Verse 14. Thou shalt not have in thine house diverse measures, a great and a small. In other words, you've got a, a, a peck sack there or a quart, let's say a quart. You, you're not going to have, um, a, a, well, a, what's a little smaller than a quart? I guess a fifth. A fifth of a gallon? Yeah, a fifth of a gallon is smaller than a quart because a quart is a fourth of a gallon. Uh, anyway, you're not going to deal one with it, one and then somebody else with the other. All right? Better be all the same. Verse 15. But thou shalt have a perfect and just weight. A perfect and just measure shalt thou have, that thy days may be lengthened. What are the rewards for being honest and treating all the same? 
that thy days may be lengthened in the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. He has given us a great land. A lot of people don't appreciate it and a lot of people don't understand. This nation is barely, uh, not very much over 200 years old as far as governments are concerned as we know them. There are certainly some governments of this nation that are a lot older than that and they're called uh, the American Indians. A lot of people like to discount that. They like to say, Columbus discovered America. And no, it was discovered a long time before that. There were cities and nations here when Columbus came. But I, it's, I guess it's how everyone wants to look at it and how prejudiced they are, is it not? 16. For all that do such things and all that do unrighteously are an abomination unto the Lord thy God. If you... In other words, he considers it. If you are one of these people that is, are, is just full, you know, this is the way click. One thing that this is so important, this is how cliques get started. Oh, they belong to our clique. If they belong to our clique, we'll do thus and thus, and if they don't, we'll do thus and thus. That's two sets of measures, friend. And... Uh, do you know how God looks at you when you do that? You are an abomination. Well, I wonder why I don't get any blessings, because you are an abomination. So you see, it's kind of easy to displease God and wonder why your prayers aren't answered. Maybe you don't listen to his weights and measures properly. That has to do with emotions, spirit, body, and soul. Verse 17. And he, he jogs your memory a little bit. Remember what Amalek did unto thee by the way when you were come forth out of Egypt. 18. How he met thee by the way and smote the hindermost of thee, even all that were feeble behind thee, when thou wast faint and weary, and he feared not God. He didn't give one iota of a thought as to what God might say. Do you know what this means? This means that Amalek slipped around behind where the women and children and the feeble were following and took them. Now, that's, that is a cowardly, dastardly thing to do. Um, and why, why, would, why would this happen? Well, I'll say more about it in a moment. Verse 19. Therefore it shall be when the Lord thy God has given thee rest from all thine enemies round about in the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee for an inheritance to possess it. In other words, you didn't take it. God gives it to you. That thou shalt blot out, I repeat, blot out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. Thou shalt not forget it. You're not to forget to blot out that, that um, and it was finally done by David. Saul was supposed to do it. And 1 Samuel chapter 15 will give you, if I remember right, I think that's right. Uh, 1 Samuel chapter 15 will give you a report here of what Saul did. He let one old rascal live and even took some of the prettiest things they had, that is to say of their treasure and they're supposed to destroy all of it because it was an abomination to God. David later would do this. My friend, you have a type here of what happens at judgment. Do you know what to blot out means? It means to totally erase. It doesn't mean to live on and be able to get away with this and that. It means God said, when it comes to that time and when you find peace, and naturally, let me ask you a question, when does that refer to? There has not been peace on this earth all the way around since the beginning of time. You may have had, been able to sit down and catch your breath a minute or two, but there has been war somewhere on this earth. The only time this peace will come is when the Prince of Peace returns and the evil at the end of the millennium, which Amalek was a type, are blotted out from the face of the earth. And then we don't have to worry about evil again. 
And God says, don't forget to do it. If you think he said, forget what he did, you're mistaken. Don't forget to do it. David would do it. You know, you can forgive, but don't ever forget, my friend. There is a great difference. Why? To forgive eases your own soul that you do not let something fester within you if someone offends you. You do not have to um, forgive to their face, else they come to you and openly repent first. I said first. But you can forgive them because of their ignorance and ungodly attitude because they don't know any better. You can forgive them in that respect silently whereby uh, it does not fester within you and you can go on peacefully with life, but don't ever forget it because that's called experience. It's all right if somebody does it to you once, but don't ever let them do it to you twice, okay? I mean, you don't have to put up with that kind of stuff. Christians are not, I repeat, not second-class citizens. We cut our own way. We take no prisoners as far as that's concerned unless they convert. Under, I'm speaking spiritually now. I hope you have the ability to follow spiritually. We're not so hard up for membership that we try to take within our ranks would-be conversions we leave that in God's hands, and he will simply blot out something that doesn't fit. In the ultimate, I speak of the time that the true P Prince of Peace returns, we won't have to worry about El Am El uh, Amaleks because when it's blotted, blotted out, it's gone forever. Okay, so I think we'll let that uh, handle the personal law and as to how things are. I hope that you can absorb and do spiritually what he has requested there from verse 11 to verse 19. It will help you a great deal in the end time in knowing how to uh, deal, live, and please God when the events that are now taking place that consummate the end of this age are, as they are now a reality that you know your place. Chapter 26. This particular chapter has to do with ecclesiastical, uh, ecclesiastical law. And, and it, this is good. It tells you, um, basically, giving you God's ordinances, commandments, and statutes. And naturally, as you have heard me say, the law remains. Some of the ordinances, especially the blood ordinances, no longer exist. And it's a, it's a sin. It's an abomination, quite frankly. If you talk about sacrificing blood any longer or some blood letting to God, I'm sorry. It's an abomination. Hebrews chapter 10 makes that very clear. So, he classed, he, he, here we go with chapter 26 and... Um, we go into the Ecclesiastes of the law. And I, I must say, the book of Ecclesiastes probably is law to the flesh body. And if you have trouble in your flesh body, you want to be sure and absorb the book of Ecclesiastes knowing this, that it is God telling you how to find happiness and success in a flesh body. So here we have a chapter kind of addressing that line, but not to the completeness that the book itself would. 26 verse 1, and it reads, And it shall be, when thou art come in unto the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee for an inheritance, and possesseth it, and dwellest therein, this is, this is what you're going to do. Now, in a sense, we see phases because... Certainly, we're in a blessed nation here. That's obvious. The superpower of superpowers. And unfortunately, by our laws of the military and so forth, we, you can see we've slipped. That has nothing to do with those brave men and women that serve in the military, but the very control thereof. Verse 2, that thou shalt take of the first of all the fruit of the earth, which 
thou shalt bring of thy land that the Lord thy God giveth thee. He's kind of making it clear, isn't he? He said, I, hey, I gave the land, that's your produce from it. I want my part a little bit, okay? And shall put it in a basket and shall go into a place which the Lord thy God shall choose, listen carefully, shall choose to place his name there. Ooh. What does that mean where God places his name? Oh, you've got a lot of churches that will exercise one or the other of his names. And the name Yeshua is Yahweh's Savior. That's where God's name dwells. Meaning what? In the Son. And what is the Son? What do we call the Son? I'm talking about the Son of God, the only begotten. We call him the living word. Well, what word is that? The word of God. That's where his name is. And you find that wherever God's word is taught, not traditions, not dreams, not visions, but God's word taught straightforward and head on. Otherwise, you're going to distract yourself. And, you know, you get a little about five degrees off here and 10 years down the road, five degrees can put you out of reach. Stay focused. Stay focused on God's word, not man's word. And you will never be deceived. Go where his word is taught. His word is taught under many shingles. It is not our right to judge any. This is why I will not ask, qu answer questions concerning a denomination, because if they have 50,000 preachers, they've got 50,000 different methods of teaching, some of it good and some of it bad, quite frankly. Now, I, I do not care to go into which ones are or not. It's real easy. If they teach God's word, that is good. If they don't, it's, it's a dead house. It is an abomination to call a house, a church, a place of God and not teach God's word there. It's a ripoff. It's, it is robbery to lead people to believe they will hear God's word there and then rob them of it. Verse 3. So you certainly don't want to take any of God's blessings to a dead house, all right? God calls them houses of ill repute in the prophets. Maybe I will leave that judgment to him. Three. And thou shalt go unto the priest that shall be in those days and say unto him, I profess this day unto the Lord thy um, God that I am come unto the country which the Lord swear unto our fathers for to give us in other words, I'm here, God gave it to us for, and the priest shall take the basket out of thine hand and set it down before the altar of the Lord thy God. In other words, God wants your very best. Have you ever wondered why God wants your very best? He said, don't bring me something with a blemish because he wants you to be his very best. That's why he calls you a treasure why he calls you a peculiar people. Are you? Or do you just get by? I don't know. You can answer that. I certainly cannot. But that offering goes before the Lord. All right, let's go to the next verse. Verse 5. And thou shalt speak and say before the Lord thy God, a Syrian ready to perish was my father, and he went down into Egypt and sojourned there with a few, and became there a nation, great, mighty, and populous. He's talking about Jacob. This Aramaic here does not worry about it, Syriac. Uh, so it, but it has reference to Jacob and 70 going forth and a multitude coming out. Why? What does that say? It says God blesses his people wherever they are, and who are God's people? God's people are those that love him. God has people that love him from all tribes and all nations. That does not change the makeup of the nations or the tribes. 
But don't you ever forget that all that love God are God's people. Therefore, through where his name is written, Yeshua, that is to say Jesus, uh, and those that would believe, whomsoever will. And again, I hope you're able to follow. It has nothing to do with the makeup of tribes and our nations. But they are God's children, and he will prosper them in their own nation, whether it's your nation or not, if they love him. God has leaders, kings, queens of all tribes that are leaders, and thank our Father for it. God blesses him every will. Poor old Jacob went down there with 70 and came out a strong nation, a blessed nation. If you don't think your father can cut it, just read the history. It was a type for you. Verse 6, and the, Egypt, and the Egyptians evil entreated us, man, and afflicted us, and laid upon us hard bondage. Now, you, you think you got it rough. Hard bondage. Seven. And when we cried unto the Lord God of our fathers, the Lord heard our voice and looked on our affliction and our labor and our oppression. Well, that was a long time ago, Pastor. I, no, you think he doesn't look on your uh, affliction and your oppression today? Are you, you're not one of these that, think God, that thinks that God isn't the same yesterday and today and forever. If that be the case, you're in trouble, friend. God knows your problems today. God knows your affliction. He takes note. I don't know. That's why I try to encourage you. Tell him you love him. You know, when you make certain that he knows personally that you love him, if somebody steps on your toe, do you think he's not going to move them way off? He will. God notes, and God takes care of his own. It's his promise and I guarantee you, if you think he didn't do it with 70 coming out of Egypt, why would you think he, doesn't, he wouldn't do it today? That's why this is important. It is a type set forth with you whereby you can have God's blessing. And I don't know how many people in this world will write, call, or whatever and say, how can I know I'm serving God properly? My friend, understand his word. Go where his word is written. That is to say the word of God. If someone chooses to be ignorant, let them be ignorant still. But let's get on with Father's word. He knows when someone oppresses you, and he takes care of it in his time when you have learned. Eight, the quicker you learn, the quicker it passes. Make sense? God is always fair. Verse 8, and the Lord brought us forth out of Egypt with a mighty hand and with an outstretched arm and with great terribleness, and with signs, and with wonders. Uh, water to blood, frogs, uh, insects, raining fire and ice at the same time. Nine. And he hath brought us into this place, and hath given us this land, uh, even a land that floweth with milk and honey. We got it so good here, we can't understand it. We have to build extra places to store grain or it spoils, whatever it's at harvest time, we have to pour it out on the ground in huge piles. Any of you in the plains know this. We, we are so blessed that each time you see one of those huge stacks of grain out in the weather piled because we can't even ship it out quick enough, then don't you wonder why God doesn't bless us. That's, that's, a, 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 that's blasphemy. Basically, it is that you are so blind you couldn't see the blessings because uh, maybe you haven't been getting your part of the milk and your part of the honey. Well, you got to earn God's blessings before he'll give them. It's that simple. There's plenty to go around. But this is why communism is such a flop of failure. They don't work to earn. They don't produce. 
Well, I'll get the same part. Doesn't matter. Let old Joe break his back. I'll just sit back and get my part anyway. That's the good thing about communism. We can all starve to death at the same time. That's what it means. But you've got socialists that are so, well, ignorant that they can't look at the communist countries today and see a bunch of people starving. And if, if they want to build something with the high technology that we use, they got to steal it. You want to go with a bunch of steal, uh, thieves? Well, you're insulting the people. No, I'm not. If they're thieves, they're thieves, and that's it. If they want to be thieves, they should wear it proudly. Verse 10, I'm saying God blesses whom he will bless. Others must steal. Which are you going to go with, God or go over and join the others? Doesn't make me any difference. 10, and now behold, I have brought the first fruits of the land which thou, O Lord, hast given me. This is telling you how to talk to the Father. And thou shalt set it before the Lord thy God and worship before the Lord thy God. Let him know you love him. 11, listen carefully. And thou shalt rejoice in every good thing which the Lord thy God hath given unto thee and unto thine house, thou and the Levite and the stranger that is among you. Let me ask you something. It's so easy to read over that little word rejoice. Is there rejoicing in your house with God's blessings? Each time, yeah, you work for the paycheck, but once you receive your paycheck, do you thank God for the fact that he gave us this land and that he gave you the health to earn that check and that you can rejoice in what you have? Now, if you're one that's picky, 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 gripe, 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 and you don't appreciate what God gives you, then why do you think he would want to give you any more? If all you can do is gripe and poor me, baby, and all that kind of stuff. Now, he said, I want you to rejoice. Maybe it would help you if you looked at some of those communist countries and how uh, beggardly poor they are and how they have to live. And uh, maybe it would make you feel you had more to rejoice about. I think that's one of the first things that I learned about this great nation was to love it and appreciate it when I saw how others around the world lived. And I've been all the way around this world a couple of times. And I've spent time in the countries to see how they do. Rejoice in your home or something is wrong. If you are a Christian family and you don't rejoice, uh, naturally there are times that we're all under stress and there are trauma, but basically overall God's Word gives you the starch to go through the trauma and come out um, in good shape and have a family rejoicing. If you're not rejoicing, something is wrong. Start taking inventory. Something's wrong. Well, I think that's a good place to stop for today. And thou shalt rejoice in every good thing. You're going to rejoice in what? Every good thing. And let me tell you something. If you live in this good nation, then the very air you breathe is a good thing. Why? Because it gives you life. Who provided the air? God did. Man pollutes it terribly. But there's a lot of good things. If I were you, I would talk to my father about how you appreciate especially the good things. Maybe he's given you a good wife or a good husband or good children. <laughs> it's something to rejoice about, beloved. Some people just take life so much for granted. Yes, the sun came up this morning and it's probably gonna go down tonight. Well, I hope it does. I mean, that's about the way the old cookie crumbles, isn't it? I don't know. Are you appreciative of your father? Then let him know you love him. Don't miss the next lecture. There we have the ecclesiastical law. Receive it. All right, bless your heart. You listen a moment, won't you please? The mark of the beast.